we are so thankful to you our father for this beautiful morning thank you that your mercies are renewed every morning and thank you that we are in your presence once again to learn from your word our father we ask you to bless our teacher we ask you to bless each of our students lord father who are joining in who would be listening on the recording that they would all be blessed in their walk with you as we are being enriched with the word let the word be a lamp to our feet and light to our path father continue to lead us by the power of your holy spirit In all your goodness and faithfulness we stand and father we want to thank you for this privilege we thank you for this platform we thank you for each of us that we are here let our hearts receive everything in its fullness above father and be blessed in our walk with you once again we thank you and we ask you to bless each of us in your precious and matchless name we ask and we pray amen amen thank you so much avni all right uh yeah so uh, last week we looked at john chapter 3 and because john chapter 3 has got some very central truths uh, which in fact uh, you would see repeated again and again throughout the book of john so we wanted to focus on just that one chapter so we devoted um, an uh, entire uh, you know to us to the book uh, to the chapter 3 uh, but now uh, today we will uh, you know rush forward a little bit so uh, today we would be covering both chapter 4 and chapter 5 uh, so we may not be able to cover literally every single verse uh, in these two chapters but we will try to you know um, uh, touch upon all the main uh, concepts which are there in these two chapters all right um, and let me keep my chat visible beside me just in case anyone has anything to say yes all right um yeah you know as usual if we could have people read out and uh, like i always say you know don't uh, politely in a christ like manner wait for one another to read just one of you you know just get started so that we don't waste time you know so that we can um, uh, cover as much as possible so if we could have one person read out the first three verses of chapter 4 John chapter 4 1 to 3 words when therefore the lord knew how the pharisee had heard that jesus made and baptized more disciples than john though jesus himself baptized not but his disciples he left judea and departed again into galilee yeah so over here we learn that not only are john's disciples a little upset uh that um jesus is gaining more and more followers but we see that even the pharisees have now found out about that and they too are not very pleased because most probably even some of their followers are now turning uh, to uh, to jesus uh so when um, jesus uh, learns about how they are upset uh with this uh jesus very quietly withdraws he decides to go away to another place and he chooses not to have a confrontation with these pharisees at this point of time and uh, so we see here that uh, now jesus learned that the pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples and it says in verse 3 so he left judea and went back once more to galilee uh, one very important see, uh, thing that we see right here at the beginning of this chapter is that uh, jesus is so uh, careful regarding timing um, he is aware of he is able to discern the times you know uh, there are times when um, you uh, when you can go ahead with a certain thing that needs to be done because you you sense that uh, the father wants it in that timing on the other hand there are times when you can uh, uh, sense the father saying that no this is not the correct time and then uh, you would need to submit and retreat so we see this principle over here um, jesus never did things at uh, random or on impulse it was always uh, after carefully discerning what would be right for that particular occasion and so uh, we too uh, must be careful in choosing our fights you know uh 
best not to have arguments and debates and confrontations with people uh, unless we really sense that this is the right time and that the Lord is backing us up. And then maybe when we argue and we debate, um, maybe the Lord, you know, would uh, stir up people's hearts uh, to catch what we are trying to convey. And we would have the Holy Spirit uh, working in them, convicting them even as we speak. And then there are other times when people argue and try to you know, put down the scriptures. Uh, and we, we sense in our hearts that they're just simply spoiling for a fight. They're not really that much interested in knowing the truth. They just want to pick a fight and prove that they are superior or something of the sort. Uh, so at that time, uh, maybe it would be wiser for us to just retreat uh, because um, the Holy Spirit would guide us in these things. There are times when it is good to step forward and confront and speak in the power of the Lord. And then there are times when uh, he, uh, you know, silently indicates to us that it's better to, uh, you know, wait, wait for another occasion when the people would be more receptive to what we have to say. So over here on this particular occasion, as Jesus does not want to confront these people who uh, would, um, you know, probably begin uh, opposition, you know, earlier than the timing. Uh, which God has set for the opposition to increase. So uh, Jesus withdraws so that uh, the confrontations and the opposition and all of the uh, you know strong um, um, you know uh, backlash of these Pharisees would not start before time, uh, so that it would uh, so that Jesus would still have the freedom to openly move around without any real um, you know uh, strife from these Pharisees. So uh, Jesus decides to withdraw. And he, uh, it says in the next verse, now he had to go through Samaria. And now many scholars point out that uh, geographically speaking, this uh, particular phrase, this little sentence, uh, now he had to go through Samaria does not make any sense because actually uh, um, he was closer to the Jordan River at this particular point of time. So it would have been easier for him to simply take... Um, a road which the road which was going alongside the river uh, but he chooses to uh, to go to go back to galilee using the route of samaria uh, why because he had to go so it is not because geogra geogra geographical um, you know um, the geographical contours of that place demanded that he had to go but rather because he felt a leading inside his spirit that that is the correct route to take. Uh, so most scholars agree on this. So which means God already had in his mind the people uh, on that journey that Jesus would come across and the lives which he would be impacting. So with those things in mind, again, over here, we see that Jesus is being led in a specific direction. And uh, again, we see over here the importance of being led by the uh, Father. Uh, because he will speak to us in our hearts and tell us uh, what to do and how to do it and also the timing of when to do it. Um, so here Jesus feels that it would be better for him to go through Samaria rather than just simply taking the route, uh, the road which goes along the uh, Jordan River. And so he goes towards Samaria and enters that territory. And then uh, you might have heard of this in many sermons and also read about it in so many articles where it talks about how people, uh, the, the Jewish people, would generally avoid the Samaritan region uh, simply because they had a very low opinion of the Samaritans and they probably would feel that they will become contaminated if they go through that territory because, you know, those people are so uh, uh, low and uh, so uh, cheap, uh, you know, compared to uh, their Jewish heritage. So that was the kind of opinion that people had um, uh, regarding the Samaritans. And again, uh, you might have, you know, um, been taught this earlier uh, in all of the other courses which, you know, you have covered that um, the Samaritans were actually an outcome of um, the Babylonian times, you know, when the Jewish people were uh, taken away into captivity. Uh, almost all of the people who had any value, any skills, any position, uh, status, they were all taken away as slaves to Babylon. And it was just only the 
uh, you know the lowermost strata of society that was just left behind because um, the Babylonians probably felt that these people would not be of use to them in any way. And so they were just left behind in the land. And uh, so uh, you had a lot of these people settling around the region of Samaria. And as time passed by, they intermarried with the people, uh, the local people uh, from the surrounding you know, areas. And that is how the Samaritans um, developed as a uh, ethnic group. So they were aware of uh, the law of Moses. Uh, they did continue to, you know, um, follow it but now their their uh, understanding of the law of moses got mixed up with a whole lot of other um, religious practices belonging to these other nations and so their version of um, following the law of moses was, was a very corrupted version it had a whole bunch of uh, superstitions attached to it now all kinds of uh, um, uh, pagan rituals attached to it now and uh, which is why when uh, these uh, Jewish people who had been liberated uh, by King Cyrus and they were able to come back to their land, when they came back, they did not like uh, what the Samaritans had done to their faith, which was passed down to them by Yahweh originally. So which is why uh, from that time itself, uh, they tried to maintain their distance from the Samaritans because the Samaritans were so, um, they had corrupted the original faith to, uh, to an extent where um, the law of Moses was not really followed anymore in its true integrity. It had become something else altogether. And uh, uh, that is the reason why uh, the Samaritans were considered as something low and uh, people generally looked down upon them. But here we see Jesus going into the territory of Samaria as well, uh, because he not only came uh, to save those uh, who have their entire act together, but he has also come uh, to save those who are so completely messed up, they have no clue what the truth is anymore. Even such people, he wishes to reach out to them because he is their savior as well. And so we have Jesus deliberately choosing to go into Samaria to, uh, you know, uh, to be able to talk to them about his coming kingdom. And that is how we enter into the story of uh, the uh, Samaritan woman at the well. And uh, if one of us could read out verses 5 and 6, please. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm so sorry, the connection I think was weak. Uh, so I'm assuming that I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yes. So we uh, read out verses five and six. And uh, over here, we have a small um, detail being given about this area. It says uh, this town 
was situated near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Um, so uh, this most probably refers to Shechem uh, uh, because that was given to um, Joseph in Genesis chapter 48, verse 22. All right. Uh, so uh, they are somewhere in the location of Shechem, and um, uh, Jesus is sitting by the well. Uh, and uh, we have this detail being given by John uh, that uh, Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. Um, we see uh, John doing this in many places where he brings out the humanness, the full humanness of Jesus as well. Because later on, there were all these wrong uh, doctrines that came up, uh, you know, um, after the time of the early church, where people would say, oh, no, he was never fully human. He was um, he was always, uh, you know, uh, more God than human. Uh, but John wanted to always clearly establish that Jesus was not only fully God during his entire time on earth, but he was also fully human during his time on earth. And uh, so Jesus allowed himself to be weak like humans. He allowed himself to undergo suffering just like the way we do. Uh, so in every aspect, he identified with us. Um, he experienced the things that we experience as well. So here uh, we are told that uh, Jesus was tired. And so he sits down at the well. And um, uh, of course, we see the lady coming. And uh, again, like they say, you know, they say that most probably um, uh, she comes in, in the sixth hour, which is supposed to be afternoon. Uh, she comes at that time uh, because maybe she'd not really want to mingle with all the other women who would be coming to collect water. Um, now, uh, this is not really something that I ever really understood until I went to a place and stayed there for three years, a place where it was quite hot. And it was there that I discovered that truly in the afternoon time, almost nobody ever emerges out of their houses. Uh, it's supposed to be a, a, an hour of uh, a time of rest, you know, those two or three hours. And uh, I realized that if I made if I make my phone calls at that time, people actually resent me for making a phone call because that is the time of rest when you're not supposed to disturb anyone. And I, being new to that place, had not really understood that. Uh, so because of the intense heat, nobody even steps out. And uh, people generally don't work during that time. And they just rest. Uh, so this was uh, that kind of a, you know environment that we are talking about. So in the heat of the day, nobody would come to collect their water. The, this is something that the, all the women would do early in the morning where, while uh, when the heat has not yet quite set in. So if she is coming now with this order, it's most probably because she doesn't really want to mix with the others, uh, most probably because of the kind of uh, life that she is living, um, you know, where she has been having to um, go with it. A with many, many different uh, men, because one by one, they have all you know, um, rejected her. And so finally, now she has taken up with a man who is not even willing to marry her. So he's not even a husband. He's just, uh, she's, uh, she's just living uh, you know, with him. Uh, so rather a very, very sad situation uh, where she, her life has been reduced to a point where she has experienced so much rejection again and again. And now, uh, 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 she is such uh, she she has been gossiped about so much that she'd rather come in the heat of the day to collect her water rather than you know mingle with these other people that is her state at this particular point of time um and then the conversation with jesus begins um maybe uh, we can look at verses 9 10, 11. If we could have someone read out verses 9, 10, and 11, please. Am I not audible? Could someone please read out? 9, 10, 11. Larina. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Okay, Kong, Kong please, uh, please read. 
Okay. Uh, the woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift of God, knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have it. Uh, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? All right. Um, I'm noticing that my voice is getting transmitted through the microphone, but then when uh, you people speak, it's coming out through this um, mic system here. Uh, my, my speech is perfectly clear, is it? I mean, because I do not want the uh, recording to get affected. Uh, as I am speaking, is my voice completely clear? You are clear. I can get you clearly. Very clear. Very clear. Perfect. All right. Then in that case, we'll just <laughs> go on as it is. Uh, yes. So over here, um, Jesus says, you know, I actually know where you can get some living water. And uh, as the commentaries explain to us, the word living water just basically means spring water. What is that? Water that is springing out of the uh, from from underground sources. Um, and uh, so they can they just use the term living you know, alive, water which is alive, because uh, they meant that um, it's not just stagnant water, but it, this is water which is literally springing out um, out, out of a uh, underground source. So they would call it living water. So uh, this um, lady probably assumed that there's maybe some hidden spring somewhere nearby, and Jesus knows about that particular uh, thing. And uh, um, uh, so the so she takes it in that sense and of course we know that jesus was speaking in a spiritual sense he was using a physical um, uh, metaphor to talk about something uh, uh, spiritual and um, so the conversation kind of goes on for a few verses um, and um, Jesus says, everyone who drinks from this water, they would be never be thirsty again. And then in verse 15, she's finally kind of uh, interested. So she thinks, OK, this would be something good. So she says, uh, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty. And then uh, Jesus very deliberately brings the conversation around uh, to her situation, uh, the life that she has been living. Uh, so if one of us could read out verses 16, 17, 18. For God so loved the world. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you had already five husbands, and he whom you now has is not your husband. In that says thou truly. Okay, so over here, um, um, she is forced to admit what her life has been. And uh, uh, so Jesus um, touches upon that topic because he is supposed to be a doctor, a physician. A physician doesn't pretend that the uh, disease is not there. He points it out, even if the patient may not be aware that they have that particular sickness, it becomes the doctor's duty to put his finger on that and point out and say, see, here is an issue that you have, and uh, it needs treatment. It needs to be dealt with. Uh, so um, Jesus, in that sense, you know, being the doctor who has come uh, to take care of the sick, to attend to them. Uh, so uh, here he, he makes this point of uh, confronting her with the uh, sinful life that she has been uh, leading. Uh, but at the same time, we see that he has taken the effort uh, to come and start a conversation with her. So he very much is against the sin in her life, but he is not against her personally. 
And uh, this attitude that we see of Jesus towards this uh, Samaritan woman is uh, something very important, which maybe we all as believers uh, should um, integrate into our into our own lives uh, because sometimes uh, because we know the truth and because we have been walking with the Lord and we have been enjoying his uh, blessings we somehow sometimes end up feeling superior about ourselves and when we look at the other people of the other faiths and we especially when we see the uh, the way they uh, you know the rituals that they perform and some of the meaningless things that they do um sometimes i have heard people you know uh, laughing and kind of mockingly talking about them and saying what fools they are look at the things they do i mean anyone with even a little bit of logic could understand that doing that is definitely uh, not going to uh, yield any results and uh, so they kind of you know mock the people uh, but i think that is something that we should never ever do every person however blinded they have they might have become you know through the evil one they have been formed in the image of christ and uh, they deserve to be treated with dignity so uh, yes obviously the things that they are doing are meaningless and it's not going to result in anything uh, you know good but uh, we cannot just uh, mock them or criticize them for it they deserve to be treated with much dignity uh, because one day you know the lord will remove that blindfold from their eyes and they too will join uh, his kingdom so it is very important for us uh, to um, never look down on a person or speak to them in a uh, you know kind of condescending manner uh, but we must also be people who will be willing to point out that hey here there is something uh, that needs to be dealt with so Jesus was very, very direct in confronting her with her, um, you know, sinful lifestyle. But at the same time, he also treated her with respect. Um, he did not mock her in any way. So that probably is a is one particular attitude that we know we could uh, adopt for our own lives. Um, maybe we could read verses nineteen and twenty. I am not very sure why there's been absolutely no response today. Uh, could maybe you know two or three of you kind of you know decide that you will help me in reading out the verses. Um, I could read the verses myself. It's just that it becomes a total monotone, you know, just me going on and on and on. On the other hand, if someone else reads, uh, then it just kind of you know it's like a reminder to people. Oh, okay, someone is now reading out. Uh, so. Um, yeah, if, if one of us could read out verses 19 and 20, please. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Okay, so uh, now that uh, she has discovered that Jesus knows things about her, which he could possibly not have known unless he is a prophet. So once she realizes that, she decides to touch upon a topic of interest to her personally. She has always wondered probably in her mind about how these uh, uh, Jewish people look down upon the Samaritans. So now she brings up that point and she says, you know, we have always believed that uh, uh, this is the mountain, Mount Gerizim is basically where we are supposed to be worshipping. Uh, but then you people, uh, the Jewish people, you put all your importance and emphasis on Jerusalem. So who do you think is right? Okay, So she just kind of uh, uh, decides to talk about uh, those things, things which are of interest to her. Uh, and then uh, Jesus says, um, uh, he talks about what the, what the true nature of worship is. That we find in uh, verses 21. 22 and uh, 23. So if we could have one person read out verses 21, 22, and 23. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, please go ahead. Should I go ahead? Yes, please go ahead, yes. Okay, um, 21, 22, 23. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the law of the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father. All right, is so uh, we are very familiar with the statement where Jesus says um, the place of worship, the location of worship, is not as important as the main thing. What is God looking for? He's looking for uh, the attitude with which we worship. The location from which you do your worship is not uh, going to be that important uh, in the future. Why? Because now Jesus is, has come to finish his work on the cross. Once he has done that, uh, all those who choose to believe in him will be sealed with the Holy Spirit. So uh, they will literally be carriers of the Spirit of God. And so they can do their worship anywhere. It would no longer matter uh, you know, uh, which place, whether it's on Mount Gerizim or whether it's in Jerusalem from which they are doing their worship. Uh, so then what becomes important would be the attitude. So obviously, this is something that would apply to all of us. We are supposed to be people who will worship in spirit. By that, of course, it means that we are people who are uh, worshiping through the help of the Holy Spirit who is living in us. But it also means uh, we are worshiping in spirit in the sense uh, we value the spiritual things that have been given to us by God. We we consider those things of higher priority than worldly things. Uh, that is, is something very important to the Lord. Uh, is the person worshiping from a heart which actually loves and values the things of the world? Or am I worshiping from a heart which genuinely loves the things of God and loves him and wants to please him? So... Uh, that becomes important. What kind of a, out of what kind of a spirit am I worshiping? Okay, it is true that I'm I have the Holy Spirit in me, but me, what spirit do I have in me? Do I have a spirit that loves the world, that rather would rather you know spend time uh, with worldly things, or do I have a longing deep inside me for the things of God and and do I enjoy those things? So if I am worshipping out of that kind of a spirit which really loves him and uh, uh, loves the things of God, that becomes a deeper kind of worship, a more genuine kind of worship. So uh, we are called to worship in spirit and we are also called to worship in truth. So over here, this would mean that um, um, all of the things which have been revealed in God's word on the basis of that, we uh, offer our worship. Um, we cannot be people uh, who conveniently choose portions of scripture and say, we will follow these portions. And this is our act of worship to God. That will not do. Uh, it would have to be done in truth. The worship would have to be, would have to be done in the whole truth. So which means the parts which we like and the parts which we do not like all of it uh, is meant to be followed. Uh, we must submit to all of it. So when we are worshiping in truth, if I'm only uh, you know, uh, submitting myself to certain areas of the truth and saying these things I choose to follow, then that will not be actually true worship. Uh, it will it'll be um, kind of uh, half-hearted worship. So over here, we should be people who worship in spirit and worship in the whole truth of God's word. Uh, we cannot pick and choose the portions that we would like to follow. So here is this lady, the Samaritan woman, um, who um, does not know, um, uh, I mean, does not know many things about the Lord. And um, this, is, this is phrase where Jesus says, uh, you worship what you do not know. Okay, that would be verse 22. Yes. Um, so Jesus points out something important here. He says, uh, well, 
the you samaritans worship what you do not know we worship what we do know okay so the jewish people had been given the uh, the entire truth of um, of god's word so they really knew what they are worshiping why they are worshiping yahweh how they are supposed to worship him they have all the details but uh, if you look at um, many of them and the way they were living their lives, even knowing the whole truth, they were not following the Lord at all. Um, especially the Pharisees who would have been highly knowledgeable. They would have known all the details about worship. Uh, so if they had to conduct a seminar on worship, they would really totally get it right because they would know, um, you know how it is to be done, how worship is to be done, why it should be done what attitude with it with which it should be done they would have all of those details but were they actually doing the worship no they were not uh, so that is the tragedy the jewish people fully knew what they are supposed to do but they were not doing it on the other hand the samaritans they down the ages you know over the generations they had been taught a mixture of all kinds of superstitions and a partial love pieces of truth and so they genuinely did not know what they were supposed to be doing so in a in a sense the sin of the jewish people was greater than the sin of the samaritans so here was a woman with half baked knowledge she didn't really know how worship should be done and uh, the, the truths regarding it but one little thing she knew and she held on to that was the fact that one day in this uh, you know in the, in the law of moses which had been handed down to them in in its uh, in a kind of messed up way because they had added all kinds of extra things to the law of moses but one thing she knew because over there in the law of moses moses had said one day a prophet will come to you a prophet like me will be sent to you and so she knew that one day a messiah would come and um, in spite of the kind of life that she had been living there's this hope that she's holding on to that this messiah will not just be the messiah of the world that maybe this messiah will maybe even be her messiah you know someone who can help her with the mess of her life of her personal life so here is this woman who probably would just be you know dismissed by society as someone too rotten to even uh, consider but she is sitting here with this desire in her heart that this a messiah who will come one day and maybe you know he can bring a uh, hope and redemption into her life and so i am just thinking this is entirely my assumption maybe that's the reason why you know the father guides uh, jesus to go through samaria because here is a woman who's down at the bottom who is nothing when it comes to uh, you know social standards and so social morals but a woman in her state is holding on to a hope in her heart for a messiah who has been promised by moses and uh, so over here uh, we see that this little bit which she knows which is holding on to jesus takes that little bit and starts his new work in her life so uh, the point i mean I, I just saw someone raise their hand and i'll get to them in a moment the point that i am trying to make is that we are supposed to worship in spirit and in truth and it's true that we don't already know everything there is to know because every day as we spend time in god's presence we kind of learn uh, a little more so uh, even though we may not know everything whatever we do know if we are holding on to it and valuing it and standing upon that and you know giving our worship then because we have little and we have interest in the little which we have been given we will be given more okay so um just like this lady who was no worth she had which she was holding on to that led to a lot more in fact it led to her salvation and not just her salvation but the salvation of all the people in her town so whatever we have been we have learned whatever god has revealed to us during our quiet time uh, during uh, you know the, the time that we spend uh, reading his word uh, reading books which teach us about uh, these things of god uh, whatever we have learned whatever we have gained if we can hold on to that and uh, really worship him uh, out of that knowledge then more will be given to us in god's time uh, so yes yeah, uh, someone had raised a hand and uh, I couldn't catch the name at that time. Uh, 
would someone like to you know raise a question right now no okay fine um, we'll uh, we'll just move on <laughs> okay so uh, so sorry okay so so those are some of the things that we looked at in john chapter 4 uh, let's move into john chapter 5 and uh, it starts off with the story of a man who is uh, healed at the pool of bethesda and um, uh, if maybe we could read verses uh, three and four. Yeah, if if we could read uh, verses John chapter five verses three and four, please. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame paralyzed waiting for the moving of the water for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water then whoever stopped stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had all right okay so um here we it talks about how a lot of people would gather at this particular pool uh, because they believed that an angel would come and stir the waters. Now, this could be legend or uh, this could be uh, something that actually happened. Uh, we do not know. Okay, So um, because people have heard this story about how the waters get stirred sometimes, so maybe based on that story, which is not truly a true story, maybe based on that uh, thing which they have heard maybe they used to come and gather at the pool on the other hand who knows maybe god really was doing something miraculous at that place once in a while so we do not know whether this was just a legend or whether this was something that god was actually doing on a regular basis uh, but one thing we do know a huge number of uh, sick people would gather there at that pool uh, in the hope that they would get their healing and uh, so into the midst of that situation jesus steps in and um, yeah, maybe this is the person who had put up their hand. Oh yeah, I remember your name, Shayi. Shayi was your name. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead with your question and then we'll continue with this passage. Yes. Thank you, Thank you Pastor. Yes, I, I was just based on this verse about the people who were sick and would wait for the steering of the pool. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, is it the nature of God to make people compete to get healed? Could it be valid? Uh, to make that people, and then I didn't get catch the next phrase. To make people? Yes, I said, yeah, I said, could it, is it the nature of God hmm. to make people compete to get healed? Because it was who came, went into the pool first that got healed. So, so maybe in that light, could it be that this actually was just a myth or a legend that? Because again, the location of that pool was actually part of the um, newer structures that were built by the Herod of that time. Don't remember the details especially, basically. But I'm just wondering, because a lot of things have been mixed up with the Greek mythology over time, you know, and all that. So I'm just wondering, based on the nature of God, I don't see God you know, making people rush to the pool just to get healed. I, I feel it was a myth. That, that's the perspective I'm coming from, basically. So, I just sounds perfectly to valid. So, yes, um, like you said, I mean, only the fastest runner would gain. So, what about someone who is, uh, you know, partially paralyzed? Such a person would never have the hope of getting healed. So, yes, most probably this was uh, just a legend. Um, yes, thank you so much for that. And um, oh, yeah. So now we have Jesus coming over here, and there are a lot of options that he can choose from. You know, he's supposed to be the physician, the doctor who has come to heal the sick. And uh, of all the people that he could choose, he chooses this specific man uh, who has been paralyzed for 38 years, if I remember. So, uh, why? Uh, would Jesus choose this man specifically? Um, so again, here uh, I have 
only my opinion to offer. Um, this is just me thinking. Um, so maybe, I mean, you know, uh, we, God doesn't always explain himself, so we cannot be sure why he, this particular person was chosen. Uh, but um, uh, this is what I think. Um, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, whenever we see, uh, you know, wherever we see, we see stories of uh, God always picking on the weakest, uh, God always picking on the one who is um, uh, maybe undeserving, you know, and he gives them a second chance. Uh, so the ones who are uh, weakest and who would never get chosen, he chooses them. The ones who are uh, really so bad that they don't deserve a second chance, he gives them a second chance. So it's like as if he's always watching out for the underdog. And uh, so maybe I'm just assuming uh, Jesus chooses um, to uh, to you know heal this particular man uh, because uh, of his past because of the kind of life that he had led in the past, because a lot of people who were gathered in those five large porches, porches, you know, this pool had, was surrounded by five large porches. And so you, you would have a large number of people, uh, you know, waiting over there for healing. And uh, most of them would have uh, become sick for no fault of their own. You see, it was just ailments because they're living in a sinful fallen world. Uh, sickness came to them and they were suffering. So most of those people over there would be innocent victims who have not really uh, done anything to bring the sickness upon themselves. But here was one man who deserved what he got. Um, he had been living in sin. Now, we, it's not elaborated. We are not told exactly what kind of sin he was living. But one thing we do see at the end of the passage, Jesus warns him and says, you better not get back into sin because something worse may happen to you. So. Over there, gathered among all of these people who are there, um, you know, in their helpless state for no fault of their own. It's not that they did anything to choose, uh, you know, sickness and bring it upon them. They were innocent victims. But here was a man who had deliberately chosen to live in a way. I'm not sure what he did, but you know, whatever he did was so terrible. It opened him up to the uh, attacks of the evil one. I know, completely exposed him to the acts of the evil one, and he became captive to them. For 38 years, they had held him captive. Uh, so he brought this upon, upon his head. And Jesus chooses to pick a person like this for healing. Uh, you know, he goes to the sickest person, the one who, who doesn't even deserve to be healed. And he chooses him to heal. And this would have been a great testimony to all the others who are you know, watching. So imagine what impact this would have had on all the other sick people over there. They would have thought, if Jesus is willing to heal someone like that, knowing what he is, knowing what he had done, then definitely Jesus would be willing to heal us. So I'm sure after this incident, after this event, many of them would have placed their faith in Jesus and they would have gone to him for their healing. Uh, so um, uh, God tends to look for the weakest the most helpless, uh, the most undeserving, and he reaches out to them. So he's a redeemer for all, not just for the select few. All right. So I think that's just some, some one truth which comes out from this uh, passage. Uh, so maybe Jesus wanted to demonstrate whom he redeems, even the lowest, even the most undeserving. So that probably is a lesson which people would have learned after seeing this particular uh, event. So uh, we'll quickly go for our break. Uh, and at uh, 10 o'clock, we'll again rejoin. All right. So thank you. <laughs>